Hi, so uh, my name is Alp Toker. I work on the Clang front end, and uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, what we do, why we do it, and uh, some of the things we might be doing soon. So uh, the talk is uh, in two parts. First part, I'm going through uh, these main topics, and after that, we're going to look at some of the current topics that we uh, need to solve in the front end. So we're going to be looking at things like uh, optimization attributes, passing things to the back end, uh, a few topics that have been interesting recently. So, um, let's see. Okay. So these were the questions uh, I was asking. Uh, I've been asking myself some of these questions. I'm not actually a compiler engineer by um, education or training. <coughs> I do compilers because uh, I need to solve a problem. Uh, I write software, I write web browsers, uh, that's what I do. I work on the WebKit browser engine, and we have a lot of C++. We need to compile huge projects, and we need to not only compile them, we need to refactor them, we need to do stuff with our code. And we were hitting limitations with um, GCC, with MSVC, all the things that we were using to build WebKit. Uh, it, it was becoming a barrier for day-to-day -day work. So as you do in open source, uh, we decided to take a look at uh, alternatives, options, and uh, I, I had a look at Clang a few years ago, and a bit of an adventure started then, kind of a bit of a distraction even, I suppose, from the real task of uh, fixing browsers, and we ended up <coughs> doing a lot of stuff with Clang. We started out in-house, and uh, we moved towards uh, upstreaming. So at the moment, we're in upstreaming mode. We're putting patches back into open source, working with the community, and uh, I'm helping maintain the parser of Clang. So uh, what can we achieve going beyond compilation? As I said, it's much more than just a compiler. It's, uh, it's an entire tool chain. It's got libraries in it. And these are the things that make Clang special. You can actually use it to build your own tools, tools that refactor, rewrite stuff. Um, why did this happen? There's some politics involved. Um, in some sense, maybe other compilers should have got there earlier if they've been around for longer, but uh, that didn't happen. So I'm going to have a look at that. And what other things can we do to make uh, life easier for developers? So uh, right now we have a compiler, we have a library that lets people plug it in, but uh, maybe there are things we can solve. We already know about expressive diagnostics. I think I'm not going to go into expressive diagnostics because everyone's. Uh, Everyone's spoken about that, and we know that already. There's other stuff to be looking at. So, um, and finally, I'm going to have a look at uh, the social change idea. It's a compiler. It's just another tool. How could that possibly create uh, social change? Well, insofar as everything goes through the compiler, it has some significance. Uh -huh. And this is something that uh, struck me when uh, I started working, I suppose, on the front end, and you realize that when you fix one issue here, a hundred more, a thousand more projects work. There's such a long tail of uh, projects that you can support. Even in the early days of Clang, because um, we were doing that quite a few years ago, uh, you would see more support, more applications start to compile. You see that it's actually happening. Uh, so it, it's, it's been built up quite recently over the last uh, few years. It's, it's a fresh start. It's a compiler written in C++, so it self-hosts, it compiles itself. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to give a bit of uh, in background, how is it built, what's inside, just so you know what's going on. We have something called lowering in LLVM, and people always ask, uh, people always ask, what is lowering? It comes up a lot. And lowering just means moving stuff from one representation to another, usually lower level one. So we start at the top. We have source code goes in. C, C++, Objective-C, Objective-C++. Various variations on that, different language standards. Um, <coughs> goes in the driver, usually. The driver is a component that is GCC compatible. It's, it takes the same flags 
it uh, has a very familiar user interface. It's a separate process, and it kicks things off. That's the thing you pass your command lines arguments into. Uh, there's also another driver. There's at least two drivers at the moment in SVN. There's Clang CL, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Uh, that's the Microsoft Visual Studio compatible driver. So we, we've got two drivers, and then these call into the front end. Despite its name, the front end isn't at the very front. It's, it's in between. <laughs> um, the front end is the brains. It does the cool stuff. It, it passes, it does semantic analysis, it does uh, stuff that you would consider a compiler, at least if you're a front end kind of person. That's the meat. Um, and that uh, ends up lowering down to IR. It has something called cogen, which is actually IR generation. Uh, and that creates your more familiar intermediate representation of your code in uh, LLVM format. And uh, then the driver might go ahead and take object file output, pass it through to the linker, and through that pipeline, you go from source code to um, basically binaries you can link, you can run. These are executables, these are uh, things we know of as uh, compiler output. So a compilation actually invokes various processes. It, it's not uh, just one app. It calls itself from time to time. It calls linkers. It calls other things. It calls assemblers sometimes. It's, it's a kind of a closed box. It decides when it wants to do it itself, when it wants to call out into another tool. So if we dig into the uh, front end, uh, this is the front end, or an approximation of that. And there's more lowering going on here. Everything's always percolating downwards. Uh, down towards IR. And you can see, again, the source code goes in at the top. You lex, you pass, you do your semantic analysis. So lexing means turning uh, characters into a stream of uh, token tokenization. Passing means taking those tokens, turning them into something of an AST. Through uh, In Clang, the semantic analysis comes first. So uh, the semantic analysis builds the abstract syntax tree. Abstract syntax tree is a tree of your source code. And there's also the static analyzer, which also gets called in from time to time uh, by semantic analysis to provide more expressive warnings and diagnostics. So through that pipeline, you end up, uh, again, at code gen, at uh, IR gen. And you've got more or, more or less there to a binary output. And then <coughs> LLVM does its stuff, uh, which probably a lot of uh, there's a few talks today about uh, code gen uh, back in the LVM back end. So I'm going to focus on the front end here. These are the actual full list of modules. So you can see there's various things, but they map to the concepts that we're interested in. So this is the cool stuff. This is the exciting stuff that makes Clang clangy and, and nice to use. Uh, they all do kind of the same thing. Well, the ones at the top, at least. Um, some of them use each other. These are facilities for using compiler internals to do cool stuff. Uh, so there's tooling, libtooling, which uh, lets you roll your own compiler. You can actually, uh, with I think six lines of code, eight lines of code, you can actually write a small program with your own main function that uh, lets you write a compiler. It takes in command line arguments and it generates output. There's uh, libclang, which is the stable C API, which uh, uses C index, and that lib libclang lets you uh, go through your AST, it lets you look at your inter intermediate representation, it's a stable API, so applications can use that, uh, IDs tend to use that. It's, it's, it's maintained separately, so sometimes it needs to catch up with the core internals. If for new, uh, new language constructs, uh, it's, it's sometimes behind. But if you weigh that up against it being stable, that's, that's pretty cool. And a lot of uh, applications use that. Also, language bindings use libclang to uh, support access to the AST and uh, indexing from language bindings. So apart from that, there's also plugins. Plugins that use the full internals of Clang uh, they are also kind of uh, <coughs> creepy. They don't always work. Um, they're less maintained. They weren't tests until a week ago. Uh, so plugins right now, 
aren't used that much uh, because it's it depends on internal representations. It depends on the internal API of Clang. So people always ask on the mailing list uh, which one should we use. There's all these options. Uh, generally, tooling or libclang are the viable options for applications embedding <coughs> Clang. <coughs> so why do all of this? I suppose. Um, we want access to these internals. We want to be able to uh, see inside our code. We want to be able to manipulate our code. Uh, if, if all we want to do is compile software, then uh, sure, there's, there's already compilers out there. But really, there hasn't been something on the scale in open source. Uh, there were a few very interesting academic projects for, for various tasks like refactoring or individual problems, but uh, none of them really pulled it all together. So it makes sense to take the compiler that's there and also provide access to external applications and uh, these various use cases. So there's been a bit of a craze in uh, Clang. Nobody knows quite why, but there's some good reasons why. Um, so a lot of people have been pushing for compatibility with Microsoft Visual C++. Uh, and it's kind of uh, it's a, it's a fever. You get into it in a big way. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, you feel this rush. Wow. <coughs> um, but this is probably maybe closer to a motivation for uh, playing with purpose. You know, we have this thing. It passes standard stuff, ISO C++, C++ extensions. Uh, yeah, sure, C was there first. Um, some. Uh, other standards, some interesting things like uh, parallelism, or you have uh, GPU uh, specializations, which are C-like languages. That's where the name comes from, so it's uh, C lang, clang. And uh, there's something missing, there's a bit missing in the corner. And that's the long tail of Microsoft Visual C++ applications. So what we really can achieve by this is uh, building real software out there, a huge amount of projects that uh, that aren't currently portable to Unix. So that's one advantage, one thing that we get out of it. And the second benefit is the other way around. Uh, we get to put the compiler on Windows, and we get to uh, give developers on their native platform a better experience. And both of these are really compelling. So porting, we get porting to Unix, and we get to um, help developers actually port their Unix software to Windows. So that's two for one. That's pretty neat. So it's it's a bit, it's a bit tricky. There's uh, various things, fun things in Microsoft Visual C++, but uh, it's been coming for a while. Uh, it's more than Windows support. It's it's not just porting the compiler to Windows. I saw a comment on a forum somewhere saying, um, why? Why is Windows support a big deal? Surely if you port the file system access, uh, then it will compile. But it's doing something different. It's not really Windows support. It's, it's MSVC support. And we need to be more clear about that when we describe it. And the changes, the differences are all through the stack. From parsing, uh, there's various things that are different in parsing. There's uh, the ABI is different when you're generating IR. There's all kinds of... Um, things in semantic analysis that uh, need to be different. So it's a bit of work, and it's a major impact on the so uh, code base. But it's been coming together, and uh, it's very close now to bootstrapping, to self-hosting. So it would be able to compile using uh, Microsoft headers on Windows, which is quite exciting. It means uh, you've got a drop-in replacement at that point for uh, the Microsoft C++ compiler. So that's probably very close. And I mentioned <coughs> this uh, second driver that exists. And that's what enables the seamless integration, the drop-in integration. Uh, Planck CL is a command line compatible driver that uh, you can pass the same arguments, the same, uh, the same arguments as uh, CL.exe. And it does the same thing from input to output matches Visual Studio C++ compiler. So, 
big problem, but uh, you can face up to it. And uh, the thing we're doing is we're trying to be like them, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> that's the only way to defeat, well, not defeat, but to, to overcome these challenges. <coughs> so, how do we do this stuff? Uh, the parser, that's the bit I'm probably most interested in. It's, it's handwritten. This is, this is something that shocked me the first time I saw the Clang parser. I, I said, WTF, why? Why is this? It's huge handwritten parser. I mean, we're used to, when we need parsers in other projects, we, we write um, descriptions of the, of the grammar, of the syntax, and we let a tool generate our parser, even our AST, usually. So uh, why would someone go and write most of this stuff by hand. But a couple of years later on, it makes perfect sense. It's really nice. It's beautiful. Um, it's kind of like, a, the parser is like a dusty gem, you know? It's, it's beautiful inside once you get used to it. Uh, until you rub the dust off, it's a bit scary. But uh, it really works. And it lets us do things that you just wouldn't be able to do. It, you can't even pass C++ with a generated parser, at least not one that's uh, mainstream that's out there. So. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and it lets you experiment with things. You can generate diagnostics, you can throw in a bit there. It's very easy to get started and just start editing a bit of code that does a bit of parsing and fix a bug. Uh, it's very accessible. And it's unified. That's something else that would be hard if it was uh, generated. It actually uses the same pass rules to pass all these C-like languages. So uh, C, C++, Objective-C, and these other extensions all go through the same uh, parser engine. And uh, it it's used to be completely decoupled from semantic analysis and the AST. Now it's still fairly isolated. So uh, it's, it's a parser in the classic sense that it passes stuff and does callbacks into a different layer. So it's still clean. It's still, I suppose it's still uh, friendly to compiler engineers who are purists who have that separation in their minds. And there's semantic analysis. Uh, there's the brains. That, that, does, that takes the stuff from the past <coughs> and turns it into a fully constructed AST. The Clang AST is constructed. So it, it, um, it contains the result of the semantic analysis within it. So some other types of syntax trees are just syntax trees. And then you have to have a separate uh, analysis. In Clang, the analysis happens while building the AST. And this is quite handy, especially with C-like languages. And you can usually do semantic analysis as you pass in order. So it's, it's elegant to just build up your tree as you go. So there's a few things there. I mean, it's, it maybe it's, a, it's another dusty gem that uh, you need to polish from time to time. There's a lot of, um, well, there's a bit of uh, copy and paste going on there. Just <laughs> because people, <laughs> They have a need, a need for a new language feature. And uh, what do they do? They have a look. They see which other uh, part of the implementation does it. And they try to sneak in a bit of a copy and paste. And the review system is really good. Patches are reviewed. Uh, everything gets looked at. But the one thing that's really difficult to catch when someone's submitting a patch is actually um, code that exists somewhere else <coughs> in the tree. So this tends to get missed. And as a result, you get these um, slightly awkward patterns in the parser, so in, in semantic analysis and in, in the parser. So these are, I mean, these are the only annoying little quirks, really, which is good, because I've worked with a generated uh, AST and system, and you get fundamental problems when you are actually generating your uh, parser from a description. You have tool problems. So the fact that the annoyances with the parser with semantic analysis are basically things like this, like small annoyances, is pretty good news. That we're happy with uh, what we have. We're happy with the infrastructure. It's basically OK. So the question is, uh, I suppose, what stuff can we do now? I mean, we have the basics down. We have uh, 
We have it working. It's been self-hosting for a long time. It's going to work as a drop-in replacement for Visual Studio pretty soon. So what are the interesting things that uh, we can do with this? Are we competing with something else, or is it just a project unto itself? So there's a few things. These are more my brainstorms, things that might work, might not. I need to ask, I suppose, back-end guys for a few of these questions. But um, there's some basic things here that we're looking at right now. Just to see if we can take shortcuts. Uh, because we've noticed that uh, a few things are running out of process when they could be running in process. It's very recent. It's not a big deal. But uh, maybe we could just shave off a bit more by actually running more of the compilation in one process. This matters perhaps more on Windows where process invocation is rather slow. So um, there's kind of a idea somewhere in my mind that you could actually build your entire project with one compiler invocation. How that's going to work, it's, it's some, some way off. It may not be clear exactly how that ties together. But um, the idea to begin with is that we might um, at least not invoke the, f the, um, the front end from the driver separately, because they're in the same binary. Uh, so we can we can just swap little things, and things like that tend to get noticed, uh, get tend to get missed uh, while we're busy micro optimizing the parser or uh, f finding huge things to tune in semantic analysis. We forget that actually the driver is doing fairly big operations uh, with fairly few lines of code. So there's some interesting opportunities there, and we need to we need to measure. We need to get some numbers there. So it, it's just one theory right now that we could shave some time off the build there. Uh, modules is a big one. Um, modules are <coughs> basically the culmination of um, pre-compiled headers. They are the same AST, the same internals that you get uh, when you're analyzing your code, when you're running libclang, but they persist through invocations. So there's a serialization format that actually, uh, when you've compiled, when you've, when you've turned it into an AST, into a semantically analyzed result, uh, you can actually cache that to file, and there's more to modules than that. Modules also embody things like headers, includes. Uh, there's a lot of work behind modules, but uh, it's starting to come together in a big way. I think uh, Mac OS recently shipped. Mavericks had some modules in the headers. So uh, this is coming together. And that's going to be a big speed up, because it means you don't have to pass. It means uh, you don't have to do semantic analysis for a lot of the headers. And it means you can just spend more time compiling your code. Uh, and the headers don't change much, so it's not a big problem. If, uh, if they change, you just rebuild the modules. Uh, they're cached somewhere. Another interesting one is actually just caching some things like stats, uh, file access through invocations. Once we have things uh, perhaps in one uh, process, then we can start to look at uh, see what, what can we now reuse between each file that we compile uh, because we don't need to restart it. So these are some possibilities to just kind of cheat and shave a few uh, seconds off or a few split seconds off uh, compilation. And uh, the last one is, is my little crazy idea. <laughs> um, that we could actually dog food the JIT to uh, do things like compile time evaluation. At the moment, we have a great JIT engine uh, that uh, a lot of projects are <coughs> using in the back end. It can, uh, it can do all sorts of things, but we don't use it. We don't actually use it ourselves uh, in the project, as far as I'm aware, for any part of the compilation pipeline. So it increases quality a lot when you use your own tools. Uh, you get used to working with them. You improve the API. You fix bugs. So some excuse to use uh, the JIT in the front end, I think, would be really cool. So this is, this is an idea right now that's not really manifested in anything. But if we can find somewhere to use that, uh, that could be pretty neat. So these are the little tricks that we might be able to pull up to, to uh, kind of unconventionally get some uh, faster compile times. Another thing is, uh, I mean, if you can see the problem in this code. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's actually a problem. So 
one thing we're not doing that we haven't done at all is accessibility. Um, a lot of projects, I think, a lot of projects here you'll find, if you've been to other talks yesterday, people actually are working. They're putting a lot of resources into uh, accessibility APIs, SDKs, ways to uh, access uh, the thing, whether it's documents, whether it's LibreOffice, or whether it's, um, whether it's the browser, we expose the DOM. Uh, everything, we try to expose these in a way that people can see if, 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 if they, they don't have great vision, if they have maybe difficulty interacting with their machine, uh, there are facilities available to them. Uh, it, Clang is an application. It is an end user tool. And there are lots of possibilities here. Accessibility is something that's very natural to represent uh, trees in. So the fact we have a tree is already some way there to actually representing uh, accessibility uh, using accessibility toolkits like universal access on Mac or ATK if you're into GTK technologies. There's uh, all these possibilities to give people more access to their code, to let people code, manipulate their code as well. So it's not just the AST and the tree of that, but um, <coughs> things like code completion would also make it easier to interact with your code, to edit your code. And there's a great code completion engine inside Clang. So uh, the tools are there. Diagnostics, you know, they've got tokens in them, they've got funny names in them. If you try to pipe it through a, a speech system right now, it doesn't do much, but um, if with a little known annotation, that could go a long way. So that's one of the things I think would be cool if, if we can maybe just stand back and say, hey, we do actually um, ship something that people use, end users use, and that IDs use as well. We shouldn't expect IDs to go and try to do this. Uh, editors, we shouldn't expect them to do accessibility because it's hard work. And I think this is one thing that we could do. This is my, probably my personal view on this because I've come from other projects where we spend a lot of time on, on accessibility. <coughs> so that's the kind of thing that could be a nice goal at some point. It, it's, it's not right there yet. Uh, this is something that's uh, moved forward a lot. Um, the Linux kernel. Uh, it, it's basically uh, compiling now uh, with Clang and without much external help. So this has been a long time coming. Uh, the LLVM Linux guys have a talk uh, I think uh, 11 o'clock if I got it right today and uh, there's a big effort. A lot of uh, testing and infrastructure, uh, there's a real push to get support for uh, the ability to compile the Linux kernel with uh, Clang. And this has been going on, on for a few years now. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a new thing, but it's, it's just reached some kind of, um, I suppose, fruition. Uh, and some interesting patches have happened recently. So I think David Woodhouse, um, kernel guy, he's got involved. This is exciting because it means users, uh, they can just come in and they can start contributing. And this has happened with uh, a few projects. This has been one of the visible cases where people had a need. They <coughs> needed to uh, get support for something and they couldn't get that out of, whether it was GCC or MSVC, they couldn't get that thing. So when they came to Clang, Clang was different. Clang uh, welcomed them, the Clang welcomed their code, provided the necessary review, uh, even though not many people need this. Not many people need a 16-bit uh, code gen. Uh, nobody really said, this is not what we do. Nobody said, uh, we do not want this. We said, what's the use case? And that's cool. And that, that most of the 16-bit work went on in LVM. A tiny bit is in the Clang front end. But I suppose the main use case is through the front end. So what they're able to do is replace a lot of handwritten 60-bit um, boots loader code and various facilities in, in C, which is nice for their use case. The other thing that's uh, come forward is uh, it's close to, I think, passing all the uh, assembly. So using the integrated assembler. And this is, again, it's an LVM thing, but it goes through the Clang driver. And uh, it's, it's worth mentioning that that's the, that's the way it looks to end users. It goes through Clang. And with, with those things uh, done, uh, it's basically able to build and root. There were a few other past things, a few GC compatibility features that were necessary, but uh, it's getting there, which is really exciting. 
it's going to hopefully affect a lot of developers who, who want the features. And also with the tools, they'll get to do more security testing, do more various things that they couldn't do before because uh, they only had a partial view of their code. <coughs> so, um, yeah, there's a few more nits. I mean, I mentioned some of these, I think, when we were looking at semantic analysis and the AST. There's some uh, tidying to be done. Um, the type system needs a bit of love. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's we've been aiming for uh, getting close to the standards and what they describe. So just a bit of internal refactoring to make it match up to common terminology. Uh, and I think when the internals of a compiler actually represent the specification, that's really good because um, it's immediately accessible. You can read the code and you know what it means. So little cleanups. Uh, I'm into my cleanups when I'm working on the front end. But they're actually done for a reason. Uh, it's to make the code, you read the code, you see what it's doing. Uh, so these are kind of minor changes that are going on to, to tidy things up as well internally. But uh, Clang is also defending software freedom. I mean, there's been a few complaints uh, recently, and these are unjustified. Clang is all about, uh, but it lets a lot of people use free software who normally wouldn't be able to. And I think that uh, qualifies as a lot of the definition for free software in, in the traditional sense. So uh, while people have different motivations working on the project, uh, this is actually an end result that we've got people no longer using uh, MSPC. They're now using Clang. They're getting more involved with the community. They're, they're joining and doing things that they normally wouldn't have done. Companies that had proprietary tool chains are now switching to uh, an open source compiler. I mean, how is this? Uh, this is defending uh, software freedom. And uh, this is the first freedom, the freedom to do what uh, you want with the code. And that option hasn't always been available with other compilers. Whether it's a license fee, or whether it's some other restriction, or just the attitude of that team, uh, other compilers haven't let you do this, do crazy stuff with your compiler. So I think there's some amount of um, this freedom number one, which is to do what you want uh, with the code. Take it and run with it. And if it's good, then that's good, and it'll get taken back. With something like, say, GCC, you can get vendor patches, you can get companies, uh, they might do code dumps, they might do code drops, but how many of those actually get integrated back? I'd, I'd be interesting to see. I mean, how many proprietary branches happen of other compilers and how much of that comes back. I and mean, we see companies sending patches because they love sending patches. They want to work with the community. So it seems to work really well. It's kind of a, it's an implicit copy left, I suppose. You're, you're meant to send back patches and you're meant to work with the community. It's not enforced. So people don't have to send back contrib contributions to uh, the project, but they end up doing it anyway because they want to, um, work closer to uh, what we do. So effectively, we already get the software freedom. And there's also a slightly stronger interpretation of uh, software freedom, which is freedom number two. And uh, this one is, um, I suppose, nobody can tell me what I can and can't do with my compiler front end. And you know, if, if we want to refactor, that's great. If we want to do plugins, that's great. So. On a very basic level, uh, we need to do this. If we're going to move forward technology as a whole, we need to be able to manipulate the code. We need to be able to analyze the code. Everything is source code these days. So we need this basic freedom. And we need to fight for that. We need to stand by that. Uh, we don't get that with other projects at the moment. So uh, this is the hope we have. Community 2.0 is probably where we are now. We're, we're getting a nice kind of um, environment. We're getting new contributors. Things are really building up. The project is very successful. Um, and there are introspective questions we need to ask. These are things that happen day to day, I suppose. These are challenges that developers face. And I'm sure there's more. These are some of the ones that have come up recently. So 
when there's trouble, when someone uh, posts something questionable to the list, uh, how do you respond? Do you have a canned response? Do you uh, say something? Or do you just ignore them? Do you, do you get angry with them? There's no real clarity on that because uh, it's, a, it's a meritocracy. Everyone codes and they're trusted and they reply to contributors. So um, it's slightly informal like that. And that can occasionally backfire. It can, it can give a harsh first impression to people writing patches. These are things we need to keep in check. We need to make sure it doesn't turn into a vicious uh, project where we don't uh, welcome people who are at least trying to contribute. So this is something I care about because it's, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to welcome people to your work and then see, see what they've got to contribute before really uh, going against that. So the other thing that's come up is uh, sometimes you get people who want to write documentation or they want to do something else. Uh, in the code, and we're very tuned for reviewing patches to the compiler, but uh, we're not very used to dealing with people who want to give something else, whether that's resources, hardware, time, or some other facility. So, in terms of community, I suppose this is LLVM slash Clang, um, <coughs> we don't have a framework for dealing with some of these things, uh, like documentation. Someone was writing great uh, documentation recently, uh, but there wasn't really anyone who was able to give direction on those patches and we ended up without documentation because uh, it didn't work out, the documentation wasn't quite right so we miss out on very important things in the tool chain uh, because we're so focused on code, we're compiler guys we sometimes, we don't even know how to bring these people into the fold and say thank you, uh, let me refer you to the documentation guy, we don't really have that and we miss out because of that and we have to write docs ourselves because of that So. It's, it's something we can do to solve. Um, it's, it's growing. It's a big code base. It's a bit uncomfortably large in places. It's, it's the nature of something that's handwritten. Uh, it's the nature of a project that does so much. But uh, there's a core of maybe 30 to 40 active developers on Clang at the moment. This is based on a one month analysis. It's a January analysis, so it could be 30 to 60. It could vary. Uh, the 1.5 million lines of code, that's, that's a lot of code, but uh, a lot of that is tests, so um, it's not quite so scary in reality. There's a bit of a plateau happening there, which, which I'm hopeful is the case, because it would be great if uh, we could keep things trim, I think, at this point. Um, it keeps growing, only gets bigger, but maybe we can flat that out there. So um, <coughs> there are 500 commits per one. <coughs> it commits. Uh, each one is usually a significant commit, a feature, or a fix of some kind. So uh, once a patch gets reviewed, it gets landed. That's how it's meant to work. Um, and there are slightly more deep questions, I suppose. Uh, and these, these are the questions that are sometimes uh, that we <laughs> LVM, Tang. Um, we discuss with each other. Some people might know better than others. Um, there are some questions. Uh, what if something goes wrong? What if uh, there's some kind of patent scare or something, uh, someone says something they shouldn't and someone gets picked out? Um, what do you do? And uh, there's a bit of a, this is a weakness. I mean, I'm, I'm not just uh, being the salesman here. I'm trying to find potential things that uh, we, we might have trouble with. And at the moment, there's a project, there's a community, but uh, we don't have an absolutely clear idea of what's going to happen. So uh, transparency is good. It's, it's very good on this project. Um, could it be more transparent? Always. Uh, I believe in uh, sharing and explaining how things work, and that's not always there. With some things, uh, it would be useful to have a bit more clarity. So one of the things that's been discussed a lot is um, is there some way to maybe provide a separate entity that can actually deal with these? Whether it's, it's menial tasks like infrastructure, well, not menial, but uh, providing the funding for infrastructure and providing essential support, events, that kind of stuff. Right now it's done by people who care a lot and they put in the time. Uh, could that be formalized? That's one of the questions. And then could there be some kind of 
uh, support, at least to review things for, with a legal uh, point of view. These are other questions, and some projects do have foundations and they're very successful. Uh, others don't, and they also do well. So it's not necessary, but I mean, one thing we could do, this is a hypothetical thing, and it's come up a few times, is maybe some kind of LLVM foundation that would also re be useful for the things we're seeing in Clang at the moment, some of the discussions. And, and then we could also rename the CFE compilers for everyone, because it used to be C front end, so that kind of backronym works there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's my patch, my idea, <laughs> if I send it to the list at some point. But so I think something like this is going to be useful at some point. We may need it, and it's better to be prepared. So it's difficult. There's a lot of questions. This is a prickly kind of uh, thing to discuss. but. Um, it would be better if everyone got involved and did it transparently rather than having such a thing done unilaterally by any single organization or a group of organizations. So there'll be some value in discussing this out in the open. Uh, community has also been growing in other ways lately. So um, we've, got, uh, we've got LLVM Weekly, which is great. It also covers uh, playing stuff. But I really enjoy it. I, I wait for my LLVM Weekly newsletter. And this is this community feeling that uh, you know, it, it's, it's LLVM has been around for years, but uh, that community feeling is really just coming along really nicely now. And there's a bit of a plug, Planet Clang, uh, which is a blog aggregator. If you do anything C++ -y and Clangy, get on uh, Planet, send the mail to planet at clang.org, and it, we can get your blog up there. I'd be really interested to read more about uh, what developers are doing on Clang. Um, <coughs> it's already a nice story. There's only I th four of us or something, but it's, it's a fun story. It tells the story of a compiler. It tells the uh, story of the people who do what they do, and uh, it's our world. So uh, if, if you do blog, or if you're thinking of blogging, it would be great to uh, um, maybe have your thing there. And the, the rules are pretty lax there. You, know, you don't have to be a committer. You don't have to be this or that. External projects are also welcome. Subgroups are also welcome. Uh, if you do something Clang related or LLM related, that's a good place to go. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, possibly a few things that have come up uh, recently. There's been a lot of interest in uh, providing uh, attributes and pragmas to communicate uh, data to the back end. So this is something that's been requested for a while and we haven't been able to really uh, kind of tucked it on the list for whatever reason, it always gets delayed. So that's something I'm, I'm going to call up uh, Renato for in a second, and we're going to have a look at options with that. So we're just going to pop, pop that in here in the few minutes we have. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we have a couple of minutes for questions, so if, yeah, just feel free to ask, and if you can just repeat the question for the microphone. Sure. So it looks like we'll have a use C, 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 C plan for cross compiler very soon. To use our fastest build platform to build for our slowest build platform. So cross compilation was the dream, it was the idea. The front end hasn't quite got there, the driver. Uh, they, they have theoretical cross-compilability, but this idea that you have one binary that then hits every, uh, every target isn't quite uh, materialized. So there, there is some need for fixes, a few fixes, but that's the way it should really go. I think there's one uh, project that's actually done a bit of work there. Was it ELCC? As, uh, this gentleman has uh, taken uh, Clang and also provided headers and libraries, so he's reached that point where I think he can target more things. So it'd be nice if we get stuff upstream or similar stuff upstream. So it shows it's possible. Very nice, well, three times the uh, faster compilation I look forward to this. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't happen. Yes? Uh, 
The question is, um, should we generalize the foundation? Uh, instead of an LLVM foundation, should it be something that covers more topics like uh, building, building structure in general, maybe covers other tools? I think that could be really interesting. There are some things like uh, licensing. The, uh, licensing terms, we're very used to having non-copyleft, for example. So that might create an artificial restriction on other projects that are less strict on that topic. So I would be more worried that such a thing would maybe have a negative impact on the other projects. But I think if they follow the general philosophy and roadmap of LLVM, that could be quite interesting. It would be great to get people talking on, on that topic. So yeah, I think it's just put the ideas out there. I think there was this lady on. Ah, oh, right. Yes. Um, with respect to the resource usage, we're running a project that looks at energy consumption. Right, so yes. We've got some proposals as to what one could include from the side and how we can connect this to our environment. Brilliant, yeah. So uh, it's great that you actually have some invitation. You, are you using the. So you, um, they're using um, annotations, pragmas to um, pass information to the back end. Their use case is, I think, of power uh, consumption. They want to create code that's more efficient with uh, power resources. So it's kind of an optimization problem again. And one of the ideas we had is maybe that uh, they have something that we could reuse in terms of uh, a language uh, description for pragmas. We've got it up there. We've got time for um, to look at some code. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Let's, let's put it up and have a look. Let's let it be interesting. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Wow. Uh. Okay. Okay. But if it's so, so yeah, it's a presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, only a couple of I see. We I, I, I okay, don't yeah. think we have like so much time for a presentation. Okay, yeah. we but we, we have in the afternoon. We actually may have an empty right. spot. Yeah. Okay. So we we'll just see the process. Oh, that bit. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm just talking just one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Wait. I'll hold it. Yeah. So this is really important to us because. Okay. Oh, that's good. So, so this is the C plus plus eleven attribute that we use. Yeah, it's quite similar to C plus plus. So what we are trying to do is to annotate the code for uh, several resource analysis and uh, function attributes. So. Uh, for example, the first one we're trying to uh, say that that specific variable at this point of execution should be at, uh, less than 10. And uh, you, we have another annotation saying uh, that this, that specific variable should hold through the whole program ex execution and be lower than uh, 10. Also, we, you can specify the max loop iterations and you can do that kind of, of annotations for any kind of, uh, also for uh, probabilistic approaches, so um, branches, so you can say ignore the true case of a branch, uh, or also you can do it for functional properties, so for example, uh, if you want to say, I don't want this branch to take more than this energy, we are currently doing a resource analysis using um, some energy models, combine them, and then um, we are going to have a presentation later today on the LLVM that we might think is around four. Okay. Okay, great. So that'll be really interesting to see yeah. if we can take that and generalize that into the same problems that others need to solve. Because a lot of people have been asking for this. So okay. give it more visibility. That's yeah. brilliant. I really like the stuff you've been doing. So okay. Awesome. Great. Okay. So we have still three minutes for a couple of more questions. So there's one. All right. Okay. Is it going to be possible to compile drivers, Windows drivers? Windows drivers, and also so give them signed. 
get them signed. Uh, that bit's, the first bit I can answer because it's already happening. Uh, there's actually two Microsoft modes. We've got uh, Microsoft uh, compatibility and Microsoft extensions. And people are actually compiling uh, Windowsy drivers on Unix. So they're using this to port uh, Windows drivers to FreeBSD, to Linux, that's pretty cool. The question is, uh, does it work the other way around? Uh, I've spoken with some people from ReactOS, ReactOS, who are very close to building some drivers. They need uh, one more parser feature, they need, I think, nested functions. Uh, but basically, no, they don't. No, they said they need. No, they don't. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Yet. Nobody needs that function. No. Yeah. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if, it seems they're very close, so I think it's going to happen as well, naturally. Yeah. Um, do you also target some other ABIs, like for example, Sun Solaris or so? <laughs> no major ABIs other than. Um, I think uh, the ones, the MSVC and the Sam's Titanium, so... Um, Patch is always welcome. Yeah. If you have them, <laughs> we'll accept them, yeah. summarily. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, we have one minute left, so I think there's time for a very last question. Any? Can't you use your insight in the code with the AST to find duplicated code? Because that, that, that's I was problem. hoping someone would say that. Yeah. We have an as we could do that. We could use plagiarism detection. Yeah. We would have something useful for universities as well, I suppose, that they could detect code. Or even if you want to find nasty code in your code base, you could actually detect patterns. So that would be really neat if we actually dog food it there. It, if we consume our own dog food and use our own tool <laughs> again to find patterns and summarily kick people out of the project if they submit some copy-based code. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be freedom. Good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah.